Welcome to today's Institute of Advanced Studies in National Defense presentations. Do you know what the inside of a Jaguar looks like? We are on the site of the military school and we are lucky to be accompanied by Colonel Jeffrey. We know the hello. Hello, what's up? Nice device behind you. The Jaguar, the armored reconnaissance and combat vehicle, successor to the IMX 10RC. It is ultimately intended to equip all the medium cavalry regiments, seven units with 300 units that have been ordered under the long-term procurement method. So first question, how many people are in a vehicle of this size? It's a crew of three people, a driver, a shooter, and a vehicle commander. And so it has a lot of protrusions on the top, so that means we gain a lot in capacity and certainly in detection. However, we have a cannon that is still less powerful. It was four inches in the past. So really the evolutions, what will they be? It's now a 40 millimeter cannon, that's true, which succeeds the 105 cannon, but it's not just the cannon that succeeds the 105 cannon, it's also the combination of 40 millimeters and the MMP missile. The MIX-10RC's main armament was limited to a cannon. Here, there is a combination of two systems that allows it to engage any type of target, from small vehicles, groups of infantry or heavy armor, and at a distance of up to 4,000 meters. Still increase its lethality and range? Absolutely, we increase its firepower with the addition of the missile. And the choice of the 40 millimeters is consistent with the desire to make the Jaguar a machine capable of urban combat, since the compactness of the 40 cannon allows the elevation of the tube to 45 degrees and therefore makes it quite capable of firing on all floors of a 100 meter high building, so 33 floors when it is itself 100 meters from the building. Okay, and it has a negative travel, it can go down 15 degrees indeed. At a 15 degree angle, we can shoot into trenches to exploit a flaw in some vehicles, particularly Soviet ones, which could only shoot horizontally. Knowing that we also have the possibility to use the vehicle's suspensions from front to back, and therefore to tilt, if necessary, even more downwards or upwards. But that means we imagine this vehicle in urban combat as well. In any case, in its development choices, it has been rid of all the birth defects that armored vehicles have for combat in urban environments. Uh, already I explained it on the ability to shoot in positive sight, but also to maneuver easily since it has a steering axle at the front and semi-steering at the rear, which reduces its turning radius. The driver can maneuver without sticking his head out, thanks to cameras surrounding the vehicle. He will be coordinated with all the Scorpion vehicles, yes. Uh, that is to say, we're going to imagine, I don't know, we have servals. How many servals will be working with him when we imagine a GTIA by... For example, the basic unit that will employ the Jaguar, the Jaguar platoon, these are four Jaguars and four accompanying vehicles. So VBL currently and VBAE later. The platoon leader already has eight vehicles at their disposal. To form a joint tactical subgroup, so the equivalent of a company in combat, there will be three of these platoons with an infantry section, so on Serval or on Griffin, a combat engineering section, which will certainly be on Griffin, artillery observers, etc. And it's a coherent whole for which all the effects of each will add up and produce a real added value. Excellent. Can we take a tour? Of course. First thing I see here, I suppose the pilot is here. Yes, the pilot is in the central hatch. When he's installed in his place, you have the flap with the three periscopes that comes to close on him. And so give him both visibility with his three periscopes and also the protection of the armor. The vehicle commander and gunner will climb onto the turret and descend into position via the roof. Okay, so here we agree the MMP is the missile that is also remotely operated, meaning that from the inside the pilot can continue to operate it, even on targets he can't directly see, is that right? Yes, the gunner will be able to fire the missile using his camera to designate the target, and then the missile takes off and heads autonomously towards its target. But the gunner will always maintain control over the missile and can ask it to change targets mid-flight, this is what we call fire and forget with man in the loop. There are two missiles ready to fire in the pod and two more reserve missiles in the vehicle. Can we examine the sensors on top? So on the right, it's a digital set of cameras with day channel, night channel, both by light intensifier and thermal camera. It carries a laser rangefinder to determine ranges, but also a laser pointer that allows to designate targets either to other vehicles nearby or to disembarked infantry. Over there on the left, there's a second one. So there is an optical sight which we could simply compare to a periscope in a submarine, which is also for the use of the vehicle commander. Why a simple periscope when we already have a digital ball? Uh, it's because the digital ball operates on electricity. 
Here we have a system that is robust to certain electronic failures of the vehicle since it will continue to work as long as it is daylight. Okay, on top we recognize the acoustic system that allows us to determine the origin of a shot. Yes, the service level agreement system, which by capturing both the shot departure and following the sound wave caused by the projectile in the air, will determine an approximate distance and a direction and origin of the shot, which gives an idea on the ground where the threat is located. Next to it, I see a cannon on top. Of course, it's a 7.62 machine gun that can be served either by the vehicle commander or by the shooter. From inside the vehicle, obviously, it rotates around the optronic ball we were talking about earlier. Just in front of us. Also an optronic and digital set. The same one that is available to the vehicle commander, and this time for the use of the shooter. Okay, so each one is independent. They don't have to look at the same place. Exactly, and each one can look in a different direction. The engine chief goes off in search of successive targets, while the shooter deals with already designated targets. Excellent. We see before us a number of different types of shells. Yes, these are the ammunition that are fired by the Jaguar. These are 40 millimeter ammunition that we call telescoped, which means that before firing, the projectile is encased inside the ammunition in the powder. The interest of this type of ammunition is that we gain in compactness with a shape that makes it perfectly manageable by automated systems. The automatic loader of the machine carries 63 rounds of this type and this compactness of the ammunition allows for very little clutter from the barrel inside the turret. It's this compactness that allows the tube to be elevated to 45 degrees. So there are what we call kinetic ammunition, a simple steel shell that will only produce an impact effect on the target. You have anti-armor ammunition, so penetrating ammunition, like arrow shells, which are already known in the cavalry, impact explosive ammunition, and programmable explosive ammunition. Programmable in time for us, actually. That means in distance. That is, at the moment I do the telemetry to tell how far my target is, this telemetry will give the information to the fire control at what point in its trajectory the ammunition must explode. This information is transmitted to the ammunition by a metallic copper ring when uh, the ammunition is chambered. Loading these different shells is done by hand. It is done by hand inside in the automatic loader up to 63 shots. And then there are in the machine 178 shots carried by the machine. Excellent. These are two cameras for the benefit of the pilot to allow night flying. There is a light intensifying camera and a thermal camera. The choice to have two types of cameras, there is an idea of resilience, but also because the grain, the rendering, will not be the same. And when the night conditions with a sufficiently bright moon allow it, the light intensification will give a more realistic image than thermal imaging. Thermal imaging is really only necessary on the darkest possible nights. Still got a retro, I like it. Yes, and retro with automatic defrosting. The rear view mirror is designed to be taken apart during combat. So what is the sensor that is here? Uh, that is not a sensor, it's the mount for the antenna of the barrage system, which is the new generation multi-frequency jammer and which equips all the vehicles of the army. Is it true that it's to prevent an improvised explosive device from being able to trigger? Absolutely, it will jam the improvised explosive device triggering signals as the vehicles pass by. Okay, so now the antenna, it's hidden today, it's confidential. It wasn't mounted because there were already many things to show on the vehicle. We see it, yes. Uh, so if we go towards the back there, on the other hand, it looks like a 360 degree optic. Yes, it's the Antares camera. Because of the specific shape of the turret, we put two to reconstruct this 360 degree image strip. And this allows for automated surveillance by an image processing system that the vehicle does, that the Scorpion combat system of the machine does, and to generate alert systems for the crew based on a movement that would seem suspicious, a shape that would seem suspicious, or a telemetry, so a laser beam that would arrive on the machine. We know that there are more and more anti-tank missiles that are now laser designated, and so that it will also detect that from laser designation to guide a projectile or simply a telemetry that gives a value which is a prerequisite for the firing of another armored vehicle. So here we always have launches, yes, pot launches of closed defense systems of armored vehicles. 
the DREB, which can be in the most general case, it's smoke with the addition of thermal particles that will cause a screen, both visual and thermal, to jam the missile guidance systems. We can also have systems for defense against hostile crowds based on plastic balls. And there, on the right, next to the exit turret, what is it? So there, next to the shutter, is the aerological probe of the machine, which will therefore capture the wind and transmit its weather conditions parameters to the firing system for consideration by the firing control during the aggression phases. Okay, so when, uh... when shooting, factors like wind and atmospheric pressure are taken into account. For precision shooting, factors affecting accuracy within a meter left, right or in distance must be considered because a scope operational. On the 40 cannon that equips the Jaguar, the practical range is 1,500 meters. The MMP, on the other hand, is less sensitive to these meteorological phenomena and its combat range is given as 4,000 meters. Excellent. And there we see the cameras for being attentive. That, that's the pilot for the pilot. The backup camera. On that, on the Jaguar, thanks to four cameras on the sides, one behind and two in front, it has almost complete autonomy to maneuver its machine when there are obstacles on the road between two buildings through a narrow passage. He no longer has to depend on someone to guide him. The and here, this is the missile pod. When they are raised, we can see that the door is opened, which allows the release of the small flame at the start of the shot, which would not stay inside the trunk. So when the pod is raised, this hatch opens. And here, this protrusion that we see there is the second support for the dam system, the multi-frequency jamming system. Can the tires be underinflated? The tires can inflate and deflate on demand centrally by the pilot from his cockpit. It's a system common to all vehicles in the Scorpion range, the Serval, the Griffin. And besides, the tire and the rim are common to all vehicles for logistical footprint reasons. There is a commonality of these mobility parts. So all this, these are technical hatches, nothing special. Hatches or storage boxes, depending on the function. We go on vacation to fill the luggage. The Jaguar was sized for 36 hour combat missions, so everything that needs to serve the crew during the 36 hours fits in all these trunks. Well, that's it, we're above, look at this. So we're going to show you. This is where they're going to come in. So it's super spacious inside. Yes. Exactly, yes, the very compactness of the cannon allows to free up the central space of the turret which normally is occupied by the artillery. So there, there's a real difference between the turret of the Jaguar and the turret of the Leclerc, for example. So in front of us, indeed. And we see the optical systems, the periscopes, a lot of control screens. The shooter is on either the left or right side. The shooter is on the left and the vehicle commander is on the right. And I suppose that all these sensors, there are automations that allow automatic alerts to be raised, meaning they don't have constant feedback from each of their sensors. Let's say that the sensors that come from the Scorpion combat that is to say, the acoustic sensor, the Antares cameras, are systems that are managed autonomously by the vehicle and which will trigger alerts first to the crew. Then these alerts will spread via the Scorpion bubble to the nearby vehicle. And here we are on a modular vehicle, meaning we can remove or add more sensors or really they will all be with this complete model as well. So for the Jaguar, we have an almost unique delivery version with really tiny details on certain cameras that could or could not be delivered. But for everything that is visible here, we are on the Jaguar. This is the base model there, base model. So, which is not the case with Griffins, who on the other hand can be more or less armed, but within the framework of the bubble, could we imagine a coordination of sensors here and there to further improve, for example, the precision, or are they really each autonomous? Each will generate a result and when in the command system the different alerts will overlap, it will confirm the presence of the threat at this location. It's data fusion like in Gus. Excellent. And there, when the situation allows the machine operator to work with his head out, he will have a copy of the main information on this small screen located outside. And the 762 cannon, it is remotely operated. Yes, it is remotely operated and cannot be controlled externally. 
It's an electric ignition that is done via the pedals, either by the shooter or the vehicle commander. So I learned that the pedals are also hand operated. Do you have foot pedals or hand operated pedals at your place? Those are only hand operated for nominal operation. I hope you've learned from this, friends. Whoa, ouch. Well, here, we finished the tour inside. Look here, this is the chief's place. And there I am in the shooter's place. You see, it's comfortable, it's big, it's, it's, it's nice, it's a great vehicle. But there is the air conditioning. Obviously, wait, we have the air conditioning next to us. But by the way, my... Colonel, I didn't even ask what regiment you're from. I'm from the technical section of the Army. So the Army unit in charge of equipment evaluations. And there, uh, where can we find ourselves with this vehicle? Where do we need to be assigned? Currently at the 1st Foreign Cavalry Regiment of Carpignan. The Marine Infantry Tank Regiment of Poitiers is currently being formed. Well, friends, enlist. You'll be happy. You'll be able to fly and work on the Jaguar. Are there any drones? Not yet on the Jaguar, but rather in the accompanying vehicles. Okay, the accompanying vehicles. See you very soon with the Army. And here, it was once again the Institute of Advanced Studies in National Defense. Look at all the nice vehicles that are presented to us at the military school.